Welcome to CSEC Circle, a program where we aim to give some valuable analysis into the poems which are on the CSEC syllabus 2018 to 2023 for the benefit of our students and teachers. On the panel today, I have to my immediate left, Mr. Barrow, Ms. Walcott, and Mr. Bone. Welcome. Thank you. Today we are looking at the poem, A Stone's Throw by Elmer Mitchell. I now invite the audience to listen to a reading of the poem. A Stone's Throw by Elmer Mitchell. We shouted out, we've got her. Here she is, it's her all right. We caught her, there she was. A decent looking woman, you'd have said. They often are, beautiful but dead scared, tussled. We roughed her up a little, nothing much. And not the first time by any means she'd felt men's hands greedy over her body. But ours were virtuous, of course. And if our fingers bruised her shuddering skin? These were love bites compared to the hail of kisses of stone, the last assault and battery, frigid rape to come, of right. For justice must be done, especially when it tastes so good. And then, this guru, preacher, God merchant, God knows what, spoilt the whole thing. Speaking to her, she never speak to them. Squatting on the ground, her level, writing in the dust, something we couldn't read, and saw in her something we couldn't see. At least, until he turned his eyes on us, her eyes on us, our eyes upon ourselves. We walked away, still holding stones that we may throw another day given the urge. The four of us are going to give a discussion of the poem, which hopefully will be of great use to our students and teachers. The poem is based on the biblical story in the New Testament in John chapter 8, verses 3 to 11, in which a woman was caught in adultery and had to be stoned in accordance with the law at the time. When she is brought to Jesus, he famously said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. However, there's an important difference between the biblical version and Elma Mitchell's version, which we will reveal in the process of our discussion. We'll first ask Mr. Bone to look at the title and the treatment of women. All right, thank you. So the poem's title is significant in that the poem is about the throwing of stones. But it also refers to the troubling issue of violence against, against women. The occasional cases of women condemned to death by stoning in extreme Islamic states, according to Sharia law. What took place in the Bible all those years ago is still with us. Simply put, it is only a stone's throw away. The title in itself is thus a pun on two levels. A stone's throw is used by many people in the Caribbean to describe a close distance. For example, she lives a stone's throw away. The other use of the title is to highlight the content of the poem, that is, the figurative stoning or judging of a woman. So from early in the title, the theme of hypocrisy is also introduced. A stone's throw may refer to having a psychological or immoral perspective that is similar to someone else's. Therefore, passing judgment on that individual would be without a doubt hypocritical. As human beings, everyone is but a stone's throw away from committing a sinful act or having something unfortunate done to him or her. The poem is sensitive to harsh realities concerning women, gender politics, sexuality and sexual politics, among other important compelling contemporary issues. Several of Elma Mitchell's poems have been said to bring an original perspective to issues of inequality, gender bias, and patriarchy, as well as the effects this may have on women. The conflict within the poem is timeless and very pertinent today, as there is absolutely no virtue to be found if you touch another person's body without their permission. This echoes the battle cry of the Me Too movement, as well as the Life in Leggings movement. 
It is glaringly evident that there is no trail for this woman, and even her, even evidence of her transgressions may come into question. Taking justice into their own hands is not dissimilar from a situation in these times of a man assaulting or attempting to kill a woman based on what he believes to be sound evidence of her own wrongdoings. To this day, where misogyny is still very prevalent in a society, still t somewhat tinged by patriarchy, metaphorical stones are still cast upon women daily, whether on their characters or physical well-being. Women are still too often slut-shamed by those who are living in glass houses, so to put it, as male sexual transgressions are still never treated as taboo or scandalous in nature as those of their female counterparts. Very true. Thank you for that insight. Ms. Walcott, what about the speaker's attitude and behavior in the poem? Okay, well first we need to note that the speaker is one of the mob of men who is about to stone this woman. And I want to draw your attention to the first stanza of the poem because this indicates his salacious glee at catching this, this praise. Um, he see, it seems almost predatory. There she is, we've got her, you know, akin to somebody catching a rabbit or catching something that is going to give them great pleasure later. And we actually see that as this is supposed to be um, the carrying out of justice, but there is, it is very highly sexualized. So the language it indicates the perverse pleasure that these men were taking from this act. Yeah. And examples would be she was tussled, we roughed her up a bit, just a little, mm -hmm. that euphemism there. Men's hands greedy over her body, her shuddering skin, the love bites, the hail of kisses of stones. This is describing somebody who's going to die by stoning, but they're sexualizing it highly. So it then asks us to question the character of such a man. So while the tone of what he's saying is very self-righteous, self where he says, our hands were virtuous. The actions accompanying the words are very much in the, the opposite of what he's saying. So they're, they're condemning him. So the contradiction actually then serves to condemn the speaker of the poem. Wonderful. And Mr. Barrow, what about the, the actual diction and tone? Yes. Well, the language of the poem, like Ms. Walker was just alluding to, is very sexual. Uh, it's littered with sexual connotations and overtones. And the thing about the speaker is that he's speaking in a collective voice because he, even though it's first person, he's constantly saying we. So he's absolving himself of any individual guilt True. while at the same time ascribing you know, some sort of pleasure. But it's, it's normal because we're all doing it. Mm -hmm. right? And so there, there's a, a lack of responsibility on himself and I think he's using his own personal biases against women, like we've established he's a misogynist. So he clearly doesn't like women, and he's clearly taking too much pleasure from the action that they're about to do. And he stereotypes, he generalizes, he then he uses digressive undertones to show derision, like in line, what's that, line seven where you know, he, he was talking about a woman, she's a decent looking woman, and then he says they often are. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that <laughs> there's this slight pleasure that is there, but yet he's still you know, trying to say this is a vile creature, mm -hmm. right? But yet, you know, they're often nice looking women. He does the same thing when the guru comes in, and the guru is speaking to her, should never speak to them. So it's like, you know, why would you reduce yourself to the level to speak to this person? Mm -hmm. Because here you are supposed to be this guru because you're stopping us from, you know, exacting our form of vengeance, but yet you're going to stoop to her level. You're going to engage with her. You're going to write something in the sound that we can't read, right? But clearly she can read it. And so all of this is saying that even though he absolves himself of guilt, and he has this underlying sexual pleasure in what he's doing, he then turns it around once the guru comes in, and now he's angry, he's, ir he's irate, because how dare you, right? You're not supposed to be doing this. You're not supposed to be stooping to her level. We have deemed that she is beneath us. Yes. And then you, who is supposed to be above us, 
stoops to her level. So there's this berating of us through the language on how he speaks about the guru. And it then goes into the tone of the, the poem because the tone itself too is, sorry, not the tone, the mood. The mood isn't static because he varies a lot. He's accusing and like Miss Walker also alluded to in the first stanza, there is this pleasure for having caught her, right? And, and then you have to wonder, if this is a person you're going to be stoning, why are you finding so much pleasure in the fact that you've caught her? Yeah. Right? This should be somebody that, y yeah, you've caught them, but you want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. You don't want to march them through the streets. Right? You don't want to you know, take pleasure in the fact that you've found them and you've caught them, and then you, your hands are all over the person. Yes, you're justifying it by saying you know, that you're doing it for righteous reasons, but at the end of the day, whether you've assaulted them sexually or you've assaulted them physically, the point is assault is assault. It's assault. Right. Right? It's true. Can you rape someone in the name of what's right? Exactly, because that's basically <laughs> what he's saying. He's saying yeah. We're doing it, but we're righteous men, oh, so you know it's excusable because we're doing it. Yeah. I can <laughs> add to the diction in that as well, because like the mood is like amped by this diction. The speaker uses graphic language, yeah, very graphic, like you said, mm -hmm. sexual overtones. Actually, seems kind of depraved and depraved. Yeah. If you ask me, <laughs> um, he speaks in stereotypes and generalizations. Mm -hmm being sure to add follow-up commentary to his statements. Little snide remarks here Little and there. Remarks yeah, yeah. And then that's adding to the fact that, like you're saying, there's this depravity, and I guess it's a sexual frustration because the fact that they're taking such pleasure in what they're doing. And if you're taking somebody to stone, you march them in front of you, you line them up and you throw stones. Yeah, but you know, you're, you're handling her and you're touching her yeah. up. And, and therefore, there is a frustration and a sexual frustration that you are allowing to be expressed through brutality. So like you said earlier to Mr. Bone, there is this notion that you can do what you want to her. You can objectify her, but it's OK. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. all that hands are virtuous. Yeah, your hands are virtuous. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's a problem that we still face in society today, where you have men that believe they're untouchable and they can do whatever they want to a woman. Yeah. Right? But you see this excitement even in terms of how his remarks are so rushed. Yeah. He, he speaks and like, there's a lot of punctuation by commas. Yeah, it's like you're not really thinking about it. You're just you're doing an yes, action. Definitely. So you're not definitely. thinking through a process. So again, you know, it's like everything is rushed, like you said. And it's about, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm yes. doing this. Yes. And at the same time, why are you doing it? Uh, it even suggests that he's, he's barely even pausing between breaths. He's sweat, so he's right now. He's like a little child. This, is probably leads, <laughs> this probably leads to why he's so upset when the guru, yeah, when the guru comes sees in. her. Yes. He, say, he says, he saw in her, turn her eyes on us. Oh, eyes on. All he saw was her humanity. Because yeah. at the end of the day, he said he stoops to her level. You know, you should never even speak never to them. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the speaker is trying to as I said, maintain that, that distance, that moral distance from her. And with the guru now seeing her as just another person, just another sinner. And that is why when he turned all eyes on us, you know, he says near the end, we dropped the stone, we, we walked away, did not drop the stones. And that is the difference I wanted yeah. to make reference to. Mm -hmm. In the biblical version, they dropped the stones and walked away mm -hmm. because they realized that well, I am no, guilty, no. I am a sinner, I can't accuse somebody else or punish somebody else for his or her sin. Mm -hmm. But in this form, they did not drop the stones because it says, you know, they may be inclined on another day to still stone somebody else. So hopefully, you know, he, he saved her today, but we're going to find somebody else in a similar situation True. because they are so determined in terms of, of punishing. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to some of the other th themes, judging um, others. Um, before you go to the themes, um, I just want to point out that at the end, when they walk away with the stones, what it also tells you is that there's an undercurrent of the same sexual energy coming back in. Yeah. Because even though the guru diffused the situation, what you have at the end by them saying, you know, we're going to be, we're keeping our stones for another day. It means that the same, exactly, they're not satisfied. So the same energy they brought in at the beginning, that whole sexual frustration, sexually charged situation, they're holding on to it. And even though it was diffused and you should have, in, you should have looked in yourself, seen that you were wrong and walked away, they decided, okay, we saw that we were wrong today. Right? And, and it's that pause of today 
that makes you realize the energy has not really been displaced. Yeah, right. it's not over. Yeah, it's not over. It's yeah. not over by, end, by a long mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. Okay, so that uh, leads us as yeah. very well into yeah. Yeah. the other, you know, discrimination is right there. Yeah. As you rightly said, morality applies only to the women, you know, in yeah. terms of, and even from the biblical story, we are never told, we are told that the women were stoned when caught in adultery. What happened to the men? Was there any punishment? So it's not surprising that even in the poem, it's the men who are carrying out, mm -hmm. you know, the, the execution, so to speak, the, who are determined to punish because there she is, she has done something really, really bad. So the morality that they feign, you know, obviously they, the fact that they walk away, it means that they realize that they were by no means perfect. But at the time when they are so determined to do, you know, to stone the woman, mm -hmm. they have to show, put on the show of, of morality so they that they can be sensitive They even judged. trying to cover their own tracks because how do you know this woman is a prostitute? Chances are you may have been a customer. Yeah. So I am trying to cover my tracks. You are not going to go and tell my wife what I did. We're going to stone you and yeah. get rid of you. This is what's going on right here. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Just two things, really. In terms of gender roles, what I, I have noticed is that while the men were perpetrating the punishment of this woman, it was also a man that was facilitating her freedom. She was not able to do that on her own. So there is still a sense, while I, I applaud Mitchell's um, advocacy on behalf of women, there is still a sense that some of that freedom sometimes is only gained access to through the actions of men. Um, so I struggle with that sometimes. And also, the, what, um, what Mr. Bone kind of alluded to before, but I wanted to kind of say it again, the pace of the poem was very almost frenetic yeah. at first until the guru slows it down. Yeah. So there is, a, there is a parallel between the form and the structure of the poem, where the pace of the poem matches the action at the beginning, and then Jesus slows it down, and you find the lines get longer. Mm -hmm. You're forced to slow down your yeah. reading of the poem at this time. So form and content are actually working together, and this is, is very effective on the part of the poet. Yeah. So when questions ask about technique, yeah. sometimes students really don't know how to speak about pace and, and rhythm. But this is one instance where it can be, can be pointed out effectively in terms of showing that, yes, these men were crazed and they were hyped up, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they were forced to slow down and walk away, yes, yeah, still holding those stones. Well, it's good that you should mention technique because like, um, the poem is actually a very cleverly crafted dramatization, yes. right? Like there is, like you said, everything is just presented like this until Jesus comes and slows everything down. Um, it, it, nothing is obvious. Everything is told through this, this person who is taking part in it. Mm -hmm. So we are learning things as things go ahead. But what he's not realizing is he is the speaking voice. So being the speaking voice, he narrates this event in his own words, providing details of the incident while unintentionally revealing, revealing about himself exactly. and his companions at the same time because mm -hmm. that is the element of a dramatic monologue, which this is. Mm -hmm. okay. right? So that, too, adds to that very well. And then he even brings in narrative point of view, like you said, talking about the we. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he tries to distance his own self out of it. Yeah, that was very clever. Yeah. 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 I think the slowing down has to do with you know, the writing in the dust. So his, yes. you know, yes. his, he's not saying anything at first. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, ah, mom, this person has done something. What should I do? Punish her, punish her. You know, you take a few minutes and you, you know, let me think. But notice the guru did not say anything at first. You know, he was just writing in the dust and he stooped to her level. Yeah. So that, I think, is what gave them the pause, so to speak and force them to, to slow down. And when they did get a response, mm -hmm. they did not get a response that they had expected or, or wanted. Mm -hmm. And that forced them to take mm -hmm. a step back, but not totally, because the fact that they did not drop the stones, mm -hmm. yeah. again, the intention, the yeah. intention it's hasn't so changed. Just that we are forced to put it on pause. We'll get another opportunity, don't worry. We're mm -hmm. going to do this come what may. So this is what I'm getting from there. I think that also feeds into the theme about power and powerlessness, where mm -hmm. Like Ms. Walker alluded to that, 
the woman never actually gave herself power. That men were trying to kill her and a man freed her. Yeah. But then when you look at it, you also see that the guru, like you said, he came in and he didn't say anything. He came in and he wrote in the sand. I think, like you said, that really caused them to pause because he didn't come in and say stop. Right? He didn't come in and command anything. Yeah. He just came in and he says he stooped to the level of the woman and he wrote something in the sand. And what I think annoyed, and I think there's a level of annoyance there that yes. comes out. Yes, Because definitely. it's like something we couldn't read. Yeah. Right? And then he flows on from that. And that's when he, he says, and then he saw something that we couldn't see. Mm -hmm. So on top of the fact that he's writing something we can't read, he sees something in the woman that we can't yeah. see. Yeah. Which causes then this domino effect because the guru then looks at us. The woman knows us, us, and then we look at ourselves. Yeah. So the power in, in, in there has shifted from the mob. And although I will agree with Ms. Walcott that the woman did not gain her own power, she actually possessed power at that point. Yeah. Because it's only after she looks at them that they realize we've been doing something wrong. Yeah. Right? And the fact that this is, this can happen again, this is not over, it mm -hmm. shows you that it could happen again yeah. up to modern times. Up to modern so, like, even now, like, long after biblical days, our society has not changed because many times men behave the same way. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as, as we said, you know, if, if a, a woman does something, it is obviously much worse, you Definitely. know, than the same action Definitely. in the man's suit would have come from, mm -hmm. from that. I believe that this discussion has been very, very enlightening. I am sure that our students and teachers are going to be able to find this information um, very useful. Again, I want to just remind our students that it is not only content that you're looking at when you are asked a question. The questions that you will get in your exams, they always have three parts. And in the, in the third part, you are asked to discuss you know, devices and link the themes to the, the main part of the question. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, these discussions we have had would enlighten our students and help in, in terms of actual, at the end of the day, you are preparing for an exam. We do not want it only to be a focus on the exam. We are hoping that you find enjoyment in actually reading and analyzing those poems, yes. but also that you are able to put that information into what it is that you are asked to produce on your examinations and do very well. Mm -hmm. This has been another production of CSEC Circle for the use of our students and teachers. Thank you.